involved with RSN for nearly 15 years. Support from someone who's been there makes all the difference. Hey David, what are you listening to? Kidney Talk, an online radio podcast that talks about kidney disease and the prevention of it. Oh cool, where can I find that? Oh, you can download it on iHeartRadio, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh nice, I'll definitely have to download that. Shout out to Renal Support Network, the annual Renal Support Network essay contest. I won the Renal Support Network contest last year, the warrior, and we are all warriors. So thank you, thank you. Keep on doing all that you do and um, be happy and healthy and keep the hope. Thank you, Renal Support Network, woohoo! As a kidney transplant recipient, I find that having actual publication like Kidney Talk is an invaluable resource for any kidney warrior at any stage. RSN keeps me informed of kidney advocacy issues so my voice can be heard. I'm really looking forward to the prom this year and meeting people who are just like me. Dressing up is super fun and all the activities are amazing. Can't wait to see you there. Hi, I've been participating in the Renal Support Network 30 minute fitness Zoom classes. Not only have I lost 15 pounds, but I can also strike a yoga pose like this. When I created Renal Support Network back in 1993, I had no idea the impact that I would have among my peers. An illness is too demanding when you don't have hope, and peer support, education, and knowledge are crucial to our survival. We have a great week planned with some incredible speakers, uh, great uh, information for you to share, learn, so we can survive and thrive with this illness. It's imperative. So uh, stay tuned, we're going to have a great event and a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen. Next we have Dr. Dinesh Chatuth. Uh, doctor, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, please correct me. Um, and he is going to talk to us today about the ins and outs of home dialysis. So let me give you a little of his creds. He's currently supporting the evolution of home therapies at Fresenius Medical Care. He's the medical director for Fresenius Kidney Care Home Dialysis Unit in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And he's the former chairman of FMCNA's East Medical Advisory Board. So he is going to talk to us today, and I'm sure he's got a lot of information to give to us about home dialysis, which we've all been talking about a lot recently. Take it away, doctor. Well, thank you so much, Sasha. And let me see if I can technologically figure this out. I'm going to try to share my screen. And uh, so far, so good. Can you all see the screen there? Just want to make sure. Yes. Okay. Well, once again, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for folks who are on the West Coast. And, uh, you know, I'm Dr. Dinesh Chadot, and uh, Sasha mentioned I'm a nephrologist and really passionate about home therapy. So I want to thank the organizers for first inviting me to speak to all of you and talk about something that I'm really passionate about. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about home therapies, but I want to first begin by sort of sharing with you the philosophy around how we should look at kidney care and then go into home therapy. So as part of my presentation, I'm going to first talk about your kidneys and then a little bit about kidney health in general and then get into home dialysis. But I want to end with some positive message around living a full life because in the end, whatever therapy, whatever modality we choose, the end result, the ultimate goal here is that dialysis fits into a person's life 
the best way possible. So a lot of my conversations around how to make this all go together and how to live a life on dialysis and some of what I've learned from my experience. So as, as a nephrologist, I um, was in practice for a very long time and before I joined Fresenius Kidney Care to really focus on home therapies. But then over the years as a nephrologist, and a lot of you nephrologists out there do the exact same thing, our focus early on is preservation of kidney function. Our goal is to slow down kidney disease progression. We don't, we want to put the brakes on. That's always our focus. We want to control the risk factors. We want to make sure kidney disease can be controlled. And part of this is by obviously controlling the risk factors like blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. But it's also basically by educating the patients to, to modify their diets or eat correctly and follow what's necessary, take medications appropriately. And so patient education is critically important as a, as a nephrologist. That's what I see as important in order to help patients achieve the goals of managing kidney disease. And then another important part is making an informed decision along the way. As somebody goes through the journey of kidney disease, as a nephrologist, it is my responsibility to make sure that I provide all the information to the patient, to my patients, so they can make an informed decision on what's next and what's right and what needs to be done. That becomes even more important as kidney disease progresses and there are some life-changing decisions to be made about what is the best option for me, you know, for dialysis, is transplant an option? Where do I go next? And so I think, again, this is not, it's a shared decision-making. It's not the nephrologist telling the patient, you should be on this model. It should be a decision made together based on what matters to, to my patients. And then if for some reason a person has to be on dialysis to consider treatment options, it is my responsibility as a nephrologist to make sure that those options are clearly laid out and that allows my patients, for all of you to sort of understand what's the best treatment option for me. And in the end, the ultimate goal is if dialysis is necessary, that my patients get to thrive on dialysis. So I want you to keep these sort of fundamental things in mind as we talk about the home therapies and how it can help you achieve some of the goals of thriving on dialysis. So I just want to share with you that the purpose of what we do as, as nephrologists is to help people live a life beyond their expectations. We want to make sure that everybody gets to enjoy life, just like Chris did who is a home dialysis patient. Now, Chris, in this picture, as you can see, she's a lady who actually was diagnosed very suddenly with kidney failure. And with the help of her nephrologist and her nurses, she chose to do home dialysis. She chose to do peritoneal dialysis, which is also called PD. And I'll talk a little bit about that in detail in my subsequent slides. But what's amazing is that she did not think that she's going to spend the rest of her life just thinking about dialysis. This is a picture that Chris took while she was actually traveling. And when she went around, she traveled 5,600 miles around the country and did PD in her camper just because she wanted to be out there doing things. And what Chris said is, not, is better than I could have ever, ever said, which is, I don't know if there's any limit to what I can achieve or do. So clearly that's the goal. The goal is for you to live your life to the fullest if dialysis is necessary. So let's take a step back and let's talk a little bit about the kidneys. And uh, forgive me for some of you already know a lot about this, but I wanted to keep it to a basic level and then build up to dialysis. So the kidneys are two bean-shaped organs, as you can see in this picture. They're located on either side of the spine and they're near your back. Um, they're about the size of a fish, like I said, and they weigh about 25 to 35 grams. So the kidneys are very important. They ensure that there's not too much fluid or too little fluid in the body. So it helps manage the fluid status. The kidneys help control blood pressure. It makes sure that the blood pressure is controlled to the point it's not too high or too low. It helps balance the acid uh, and base, and the bu it buffers the acid that we get every day in the body and make sure the body is not too acidic or alkaline. Our body produces a tremendous amount of waste 
And some of them, like urea, need to be removed from the body. And the kidneys do a tremendous job in getting rid of urea and other waste from the body. And because we eat and drink different things, we're exposed. Our body gets a lot of electrolytes from a lot of sources. And these things need to be managed under very tight control. You heard Dr. Block talk about phosphorus. It's one of the things we worry about, but there's so many other electrolytes like potassium, like sodium, that all have are critical to our body functions and they need to be maintained under control and the kidneys do a job of doing that. And then last but not least, the kidneys also release a hormone, erythropoietin, or some people call it EPO, that allows the bone marrow to produce red blood cells and allows us to keep our hemoglobin levels under control. So a small organ with a lot of work. So we eat and drink various things and our body will take in whatever fluid it needs and whatever nutrients it requires. Some of the stuff that we eat is metabolized or broken down by the body. And all of this leads to production of waste matter that has to be removed from the body. And the kidneys basically work as a filter to get rid of all these wastes and excess amount of fluids and salt from the body. And the water and salt and everything else basically are, is what is urine. And the urine actually has dissolved electrolytes, salt, and other particles that is then removed from the body as waste. Why is this important? Because in folks who have kidney problems, you cannot get rid of these wastes. And so the waste, the toxins, and excess fluids over time accumulate. And therefore, you need some help filtering out these toxins from the body. And removal of these waste toxins and extra fluid from the body is exactly what dialysis is. And dialysis, again, it can be done in different ways, and I'm going to go into that in just a second. But the basic concept here of dialysis is removal of these toxins, a lot of these excess fluids and waste, and then to chemically balance the blood and to maintain the fluid status of the body. So in essence, dialysis helps restore the chemical balance. It eliminates a lot of that swelling you would otherwise have. It removes fatigue and other symptoms. So when people don't have the kidneys working and when the kidney function is down to say less than 15%, some people experience nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, increased swelling, uncontrolled blood pressures, generalized fatigue, problems with sleep, uh, restless leg syndrome. We have legs getting restless. Uh, and last but not least, some shortness of breath. So these are all important things that may be controlled and dialysis helps relieve a lot of these symptoms. So what about chronic kidney disease? Well, it is not something that's uncommon. One in seven people have chronic kidney disease in the US. So it's a very common problem and it accounts for 15% of US adults uh, overall. So approximately 35 million people in the US have some form of chronic kidney disease. So if you have chronic kidney disease, please, I don't want you to feel like you're alone because it is a common problem. It's something the government has recognized as an issue and others have recognized as a public health issue that needs to be dealt with. So a lot of focus recently on chronic kidney disease, given that it affects a large number of patients. So just to let you know what causes kidney problems, you know, there are a lot of things that can cause kidney issues, but the most common things that we worry about, diabetes and high blood pressure. These are the two most common causes and accounts for almost 70% of all causes of kidney disease. And again, when I say diabetes and high blood pressure, I really mean uncontrolled diabetes and uncontrolled high blood pressure. Just because somebody has diabetes doesn't mean that they are at risk. They just need to be controlling diabetes well. The same thing with blood pressure. So high blood pressure in itself, it is a risk factor, but controlled blood pressure can minimize the risk of developing kidney problems. The other things you think about are heart problems, circulation problems, a stroke, obesity, which is an epidemic in the U.S., is another re big problem that causes chronic kidney disease. A strong family history is something you need to think about. There are certain conditions that run in families that increases the risk of chronic kidney disease. Tobacco use and smoking is a big problem as a risk factor for chronic kidney disease. And just age itself, folks who are older than 60 are more likely to have chronic kidney disease. 
Now, certain things that can also cause kidney problems in smaller numbers are polycystic kidney disease. Again, a, a familial history is important there. And what we call glomerular diseases where the filter itself is impacted by either an autoimmune condition or other things that happen in the body. So how do you know that you have a kidney problem? Well, there are a couple of ways to find out. One is a blood test that allows you to understand what your creatinine level is. Creatinine is one of the toxins that a body produces that is removed through the kidneys. And so if the kidneys cannot get rid of creatinine, it's going to accumulate in the blood. A normal creatinine can average around 0.5 milligrams all the way up to about 1.2 milligrams. And it's a little lower in females compared to males. Now, this creatinine will increase as kidney function declines. And it's something that's important when you, when you talk to your primary care physician or you go for your medical visits or to your nephrologist to know what that creatinine level is and what that trend in creatinine level is. But another number that tells you about the kidney function is what we call the GFR or the glomerular filtration rate. And it's a lot of words there, but I want to make it very simple. It basically tells you the percentage the kidneys are working. So your GFR number tells you what is your percentage your kidneys are working at. And that is an important number to know because it tells you what stage the chronic kidney disease is in. And this is actually a chart I pulled up from the National Kidney Foundation that divides kidney disease into five different stages. So as you can see here, stage one is mild kidney damage with otherwise kidneys functioning fairly normally and the GFR is greater than 90%, which means you, you've got a 90% or higher amount of kidney function. Now, if you belong to stage one, you probably don't even know that you have existing kidney disease because it's absolutely silent. Maybe, there could be some abnormalities in the blood or maybe some proteins in the urine at this stage. And a lot of this is gonna be managed by the primary care physician. So you don't need to see a nephrologist as long as a primary care physician is monitoring this, that should be sufficient. Now stage two is when you have mild loss of kidney function. And now here the kidney function is between say 60 to 90%. So that's the range for stage two. So there's a little bit more loss of function than stage one. Here again, most people are, don't have symptoms, and most of this can be managed, again, by the primary care physician during your visits on a yearly basis or every six months. Now, where the nephrologist becomes important is stage three and beyond. And stage three has been divided into two subcategories, stage 3A and stage 3B, based on that GFR number I told you. So the stage 3A is basically 60, 45 to 60%, and stage 3B is 30 to 45%. So basically, uh, stage 3B is a little bit worse function than stage 3A is. So stage 3A is classified as mild to moderate loss of kidney function. Stage 3B is moderate to severe loss of kidney function. Folks who are in stage 3 need to be monitored by the nephrologist. Now, the visits may be every three to four months, maybe every six months or so, depending whether you're on stage 3A or 3B. The primary emphasis in stage 3 is to manage your underlying risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, or other causes, and basically, you know, watch your diet, exercise, healthy lifestyle, and managing risk factors are the two things that's done that helps people slow down kidney disease progression. There are certain medications that we know of, like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, or something that we call SGLT2 inhibitors. It's a new class of medicines that may all help put the brakes on and it's something that worth talking to your physicians about and what you can do to slow down kidney disease progression. Stage four and beyond is where you need to be really focused on preserving kidney function, but also the phase of preparation. Because in this case, there's severe loss of kidney function. Kidneys are about 15 to 30%. And here's where you need to consider the option that if kidney function were to decrease further, dialysis or transplant may be necessary. So a lot of education around options, dialysis, transplant, what type of dialysis, all that is done during this stage, and a lot of planning around vascular access, like placing a fish or a graft, which I'll touch on in just a moment, is all done in stage four. So having more education around modality options is a critical part of stage four. And 
one may see a physician every couple of months here, or a nephrologist every couple of months, because here there's a lot of planning, a lot of education, and a lot of strategy around what to do to control the kidney disease that has to be done in stage four. And in stage five, when kidney function is less than 15%, is when we think about stage where people may need dialysis uh, or definitely qualify for a kidney transplantation. So just to summarize what I told you in the previous slide, stage three, if you have stage three, you should make an appointment for your primary care doctor if you don't have one, and make sure your primary care doctor refers you to a kidney specialist. It is important to understand and educate yourself about what you can eat, how you can live a healthy lifestyle, how blood pressure needs to be controlled, how diabetes needs to be controlled, et cetera. You have to own your health, and that's going to help you through stage three. Stage four, like I said, is about getting is a preparation phase. So build your support network, choose an access type that may be good for you uh, based on the education you receive, and at least discuss possible treatment options with your doctor. And then stage five is when you start meeting with the physician on a regular basis and the nephrologist, talk about what does dialysis or transplant mean for you, talk about insurance options, financial issues, insurance coordinators will help you there. And then don't forget, you still need to follow up with your PCP to, get, to manage other medical problems. So I just want to share with you something that Fresenius Kidney Care has. But there are also so many other educational modules out there that you can sort of use to learn about your kidneys or different options. So this is Kidney Care 365 that's available as a class that covers symptoms of chronic kidney disease, different stages, different types of access. How do you eat and live well with chronic kidney disease? How do you build a support network? and some of the financial assistance you need. So things that you need to know about you and what you need to plan for is available in these classes, done in several modules. So you don't have to go through one class. It's done in bits and pieces where you can understand, digest information, and use it to your advantage. Now, what we see in the US today is that about half the people don't have knowledge they have chronic kidney disease and show up in an emergency room somewhere and are told, your kidneys are not working and you need dialysis. I'm sure there's a few people on the call today who've gone through that experience. And it's scary when somebody in the emergency room tells you or in the hospital says, I'm surprised you did not know because your kidneys aren't working and you need to consider dialysis. So the suddenness, what we call urgent start dialysis, is such a problem because emotionally, most patients, I'm sure a lot of you may have felt the same way, aren't ready to have that conversation. It's sort of a lot of information given to you. You're not sure what's going on. You're not coping with that diagnosis. And so we feel that folks should not just automatically be sort of placed on dialysis. There's got to be a process to educate, inform patients in a better way. So a model that Fresenius Kidney Care has adopted is what we call a transitional care unit, which is actually a small collection of chairs within the dialysis facility that allows patients to sort of start but dialysis, but then be educated on those options and all that thing we talked about earlier with chronic kidney disease over a period of four weeks or so while you get your dialysis. Unfortunately, we don't have time to plan, but the first few weeks is all about getting the education while getting dialysis. And the education is done in a very slow, gentle fashion so that we can, it gently eases the person into dialysis. And it's done by a nurse, a care tech, a dietitian, a social worker. There's a support team that sort of gets you through this. It's not, and it's the same team every day. So you actually get ongoing attention. And overall, it's about four to five weeks. You actually get dialysis using some of the home dialysis equipment. So you get to know a little bit about home hemodialysis. In the end, the ultimate goal is that somebody leaving the transitional care unit is well-informed and make an informed decision about dialysis care and possibly transplant. So biggest thing I've gained from this, we have about 110 transitional care units right now. We're growing transitional care units across all our clinics in the, in the country. And in the end, what we want is we want to make sure that we provide the opportunity for patients to feel that they have no fear or anxiety about dialysis, that we want to make sure we're there to support them through that journey. In the end, make sure that they have, are candidates for transplant. So just sharing with you another approach, which is well the transitional care unit. 
So the treatment options that's available are transplant, dialysis, and supportive care. So when somebody needs, when the kidney function is in stage five, you need basically, you know, 15% of kidney function, the best option is kidney transplant. And I would say the best option is what I call preemptive kidney transplant, where dialysis may not even be necessary, that the physician uh, sets the plan in motion, gets you to a transplant program, for refer, refers you there, the workup gets started, and ideally you would find a living donor who can then be available and you don't have to even go on a wait list. In some cases, you could get on a wait list even before you start dialysis so that you can accrue some time on, uh, and that way transplant becomes something that's available to you and dialysis just becomes a bridge to get you to transplant. From a dialysis standpoint, there are several options. At-home options include at-home peritoneal dialysis or PD or at-home hemodialysis or home HD. So these are two home dialysis options and an area where I'm gonna spend a little bit of my time talking about. And the other option for people are in, is in-center dialysis where you would go to a facility and you would dialyze in a facility three times a week. Uh, and then the one option I wanna point out is supportive care. Some folks may be elderly to a point where they feel like they don't think dialysis is necessary or may have other medical problems uh, that basically prevents them from doing dialysis. In those cases, we recommend supportive care so people can go through palliative care without having to go through dialysis uh, if they so choose to do so. But again, the most important thing I can share with you here is the decision has to be a decision made by the patient based on information provided, and it has to be something that is discussed with the nephrologist and the care team. So just to share with you some of the options here, if, I, if I'm a parent with dependent children or have a care partner who really is there for me to support my treatments, at-home dialysis makes absolute sense. If I'm working or attending school, I wanna free up my time so that dialysis doesn't come in the way of my, my life. And so at-home dialysis becomes an option. If I need to travel or plan to travel a lot, you know, I have my, some of my patients who've been on cruises would take their PD equipment or other equipment with them. It's wonderful. You just saw the story of Chris, who's actually been around the country traveling and, and doing dialysis in the camper. That's the advantage. If, you, if those things matter to you, home therapy or home dialysis is an option. And if you want to be socially active and you want time to interact, again, at home dialysis makes sense. And, and then if you live further away from a clinic, if you live... 40 minutes to an hour away from a dialysis clinic, and as, you, as some people do in, in certain markets, going to dialysis, waiting for a treatment in, in, a, in a facility, and then coming back home takes a lot of your time from the day, and it may be better to have a plan to get it done at home. On the other hand, if you prefer that somebody else that performs your treatment, and there's nothing wrong with that, then in-center dialysis makes sense. And if you need help remembering or performing certain tasks, Again, in-center dialysis becomes an option. If you wanna be around people receiving treatment, and again, a lot of my patients, I remember telling me these stories like, I just love coming to a dialysis clinic because I get to interact with all of you, it's like a family. That's a great environment. Then again, in-center dialysis makes sense. And if you live in a home where there isn't enough space for equipment and supplies, because at home dialysis requires you to store some of these supplies, then again, in-center dialysis is an option. So I'm not saying that in-center dialysis is bad. There are different options based on shared decision-making and informed decisions. In-center overnight nocturnal dialysis is an option for people who have to work during the day and want to free up the nights uh, to do dialysis. You can actually get to a clinic or a facility that does nocturnal dialysis and get those treatments. And obviously the ultimate goal is to get a kidney transplant, which frees you up from dialysis completely. So let's take a little deeper dive into home dialysis because that's really what I'm here to talk about. But I want to make sure I sort of set the stage for, uh, for home dialysis. So what does home dialysis do? And like I said, I'm a big fan of home dialysis. That's what I, I live and breathe home dialysis. I think it's the right therapy for a lot more people. In the U.S. today, it's only about 10% of patients who are on home therapies. It's gotten a little better now. It's about 12%, but I think at least 40, 35, 40% of this country should be on home dialysis. So a big opportunity is the way I see it. 
And the most important thing is independence, flexibility, and owning your own treatment. There's nothing better than being involved in your own treatments, being responsible for your care. Empowering the patient has better outcomes than anything else. And then the other thing is in-center dialysis is designed around a schedule. You have to go at a fixed time. You got you can only stay for a certain number of hours. More for, you cannot be on therapy more than three times a week. Being in a, at home gives you that flexibility. You could do a treatment early in the morning or late in the afternoon if you feel like that's better for you. You can do more than three treatments a week if that's the right treatment for you. So more frequent dialysis and all the benefits of more frequent hemodialysis is an option. You can reduce the number of hospitalizations because studies have shown that hospitalizations are lower if you were on more, more frequent dialysis than three times a week. It allows you to do your treatments at the privacy of your home, at the comfort of your home, sitting in a favorite couch, using a favorite blanket, having your pets next to you, having family near and loving folks next to you. So again, it's very important that if those things are important, that's the advantage of home therapy. There's some studies showing that you may need less medications and you have more time to enjoy life because it frees you up to do things that you want to do. So you can see why I think home therapy offers you a lot. And you can, we did some studies internally and we found that at home dialysis patients are 34 more, 34 percent more satisfied with their care than our in-center patients. So again, showing that even within Fresenius, when we do, did some patient related surveys, at home dialysis patients feel that their satisfaction level is much better. So there's a reason for that. When you ask nephrologists and nurses about what they would do if they were to go on dialysis, 93% of nephrologists would choose home dialysis for themselves. And almost 90% of nurses would do the same for themselves. So my question has always been, if that's what our doctors and nurses want for themselves, then why is it not the most important thing for our patients? So it becomes our responsibility, it becomes my responsibility to make sure that our patients are educated as much as possible about the modalities to make an informed choice. Now I can imagine going to the hospital being told I have kidney problems and all of a sudden I gotta make all these decisions. Home dialysis seems further away than from what I can do. I don't have the confidence. I may feel like I don't have the, I may not be able to do this. What if I do something wrong? What if something bad were to happen? I wanted to reassure you that with education and training, anybody, or almost everybody can do home dialysis. So it's, you know, there's a, the fear is obviously natural, but it's the responsibility of the doctors and nurses to ensure the patients can do this therapy well at home. And I want to use Sam Trevino as one of our patient advocates and somebody who works with us at Fresenius, who was on home dialysis until he got transplanted in 2010. And Sam said it better than anybody can, and better than definitely I can say, which is home dialysis gave me control over a disease I was told I would never have control over. That empower, empowerment thing is so important. Feeling like you can control your life instead of dialysis controlling your life. And that's the biggest advantage of home dialysis. So let's take, talk about what kinds of home dialysis are available. And I want to begin with talking a little bit about peritoneal dialysis or PD, because it is the most common home dialysis option available in the U.S. today and across the world. So PD is done using a catheter that is surgically implanted in the abdomen. So as you can see in this picture here, there's this coiled catheter that sits in the, in, in the belly uh, and it's placed surgically. It's a minor procedure, but it's done surgically. And the catheter then protrudes a little bit outside of the abdomen or the belly. Now through this catheter, you, you would put in a solution, batch solution that contains clear fluid, what we call the dialysate fluid, and that fluid is then filled into the abdomen, and that process takes about 15 minutes or so. Once the fluid is filled, you can disconnect this tube, and if you're on a machine at night, the machine will do the treatments, otherwise you would just disconnect, and then over the next several hours, the toxins from the blood will then move from the blood into that fluid, and then so that waste products are removed from the body through the blood, into that fluid. So what you see here in this little magnified view here is actually the peritoneal membrane, which is the body's own membrane that does the dialysis for you. So there is no blood here, there are no needles, really the membrane, the fluid sits in the, in the belly, the membrane, and these are blood vessels in these circles you see here in the bottom part here, and the blood 
toxins from the blood will move across into the member into the fluid and over time it gets saturated and three to four hours later you would then open up the tube you would drain it out to another drain bag and then it's time to do the next exchange and that's basically how pd is done now it is done in your home it can be done by yourself you don't need a care partner if you don't have one but if you have a care partner it's always good to have somebody help you out like i said there is there are no needles the fluid is either placed manually so you don't have to have a machine or even you know you could do this anywhere you could do this in a camper you could i, I don't recommend doing this in your cars because obviously there's space limitation but if you have a camper or some way you can do this treatment it has to be a clean space and maintain that way to minimize risk of infection and we train our nurses will train you how to do this now the fluid like i said will absorb the toxins and excess fluids and it's all removed and that way um uh, it removes and it's as efficient as going to a clinic three times a week because it's done every day several times a day so every treatment is not as efficient as a hemodialysis treatment but collectively at the end of the week you remove the same amount of toxins and the same amount of waste as you would with going to a clinic three times a week and more than anything else it's gentle on the body because it's done several times and it just gently pulls the fluid off now training can take 7 days to 14 days so i just want to throw that out there to make sure you all understand it's done by a qualified nurse so a home nurse would train you and by the time you're done with your training you should be able to do every bit of this yourself at home and some of my patients who've been doing it for a year or more they can do this with their eyes closed even though i don't recommend that and not only that they've taught me a lot of things about how to do this better so i've learned some from some of my patients on how you could do this treatment even better because <laughs> as we all are we all know how to innovate and improvise and so there's great ways so this is something that you can do very easily now CAPD or chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis and, and forgive me for that mouthful of words there it really stands for ambulatory or manual treatment you can do while walking around while doing things so you would do a 15 minute fill you would unhook and then you're free to walk around do your stuff and come back 3 4 hours later do another do a drain and a fill and that so so the basically you would just sort of you would have to come back every few hours to do an exchange but in between the exchanges you're not hooked to anything you're not tethered to anything and you're basically free to do this uh and, and there's no fixed but it's a fixed time you don't have to do it in a in a window of 5 minutes you could be 10 minutes here 10 minutes there but it, you got to still come back and do those treatments So typically it's morning, lunch, late afternoon and then a bedtime overnight. Um and the fluid sits around there. But again, we recommend this for all patients whether you do it manually or do it using a machine. I'll touch on machine just a second because we've seen emergencies and we've had more natural emergencies in the last year than ever before. We want to make sure that during emergencies there's a power outage or something that you're equipped to actually know how to do a manual exchange if necessary. Now the thing that you hear about more in the US than anywhere else in the world is cycler dialysis or chronic cycling peritoneal dialysis known as CCPD. As the picture shows you here, it's typically done at night. It's using a machine as you can see here. And the machine what it does is sort of does the treatments for you. So it fills the belly, keeps the fluid there, drains it out, and this fill drain fill drain cycles will continue several times and it typically is done for about 9 hours overnight. The good news is it frees you up during the day for other activities although sometimes some folks may have to do some day exchanges too. Uh and if you have to do it during the day it's less number of exchanges during the day and more done to utilize your night and basically sits on a nightstand like you can see here. Uh you do have drain lines that could be up to 21 feet in length so you can actually read sleep go to bed watch TV in the room but you have to be attached to the machine. So a little, little limitation here is your the machine does the treatments it stores information about your treatments but it frees you up from having to, to break away from things during the day to do those manual exchanges so this pros and cons to both but in the end it depends on your preference because both therapies pretty much do the same thing which is pd so if you want to do pd at home by yourself you 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 can do it with a care partner i said training is one to two weeks you'll have to find a place to store <clears throat> excuse me some of the medications the tubings the supplies the bags and the nurse will help you how to organize some of these things at least tell you how to do it 
and and uh, we have drivers who will then deliver these supplies and medications to your home, and and then that way you could use them at home. So again, having somebody at home to help you with this is always helpful, and organize this because clearly you'll need a little bit of space to to have these uh, in your home. PD at some point becomes routine, like I said, like brushing your teeth. And it's going to fit in very well into your normal daily schedule. And with some planning, you can travel. You, and I've had, like I said, I've had patients travel, go on cruises, go on international flights, go visit family members everywhere. You can do all of that stuff without a problem. You can put a tape or a PD catheter belt. The catheter is hidden by your clothes, so nobody can see all that stuff. It's all tucked away. And you can time your treatments around meals. So let's say you feel like you're too full. You could basically drain out, grab yourself some lunch, and then put some fluid in afterwards. So keep those things in mind. Advantages and disadvantages are shown on this slide. Basically, what I want to tell you is it fits around your lifestyle better, like I told you. It is continuous. It, it is gentle in the body, less problem with blood pressure, no needles, easy to travel, no blood thinners needed. It's been used for young, very old, and the very young. So infants can go on PD without a problem. It's, in fact, recommended for them. Less diet and fluid restrictions. Uh, it frees up your day schedule if you do a cycler. It helps preserve that little bit of urine and kidney function that you have. And it, it saves you all that hassle of going to a dialysis clinic. The disadvantage here is you have to be trained. You have to have a catheter in the belly. It has to stay there. you got to take care of the catheter, minimize the risk of infection. You have to wash your hands every day. Make sure you are very clean. Um, you may have a little larger waistline due to carrying the fluid. You've got to think about that. Although it doesn't mean you've gained weight. It's just that the fluid may be visible to some. Um, you may have difficulty doing this if you have many abdominal surgeries. So if you have multiple surgical procedures in the belly, this may become a problem. It is done daily. So there's a little bit of commitment here and responsibility that you need to do. And you will need some place at home to store supplies. And one thing I need to point out is PD will last typically for about three to five years, although my longest patient on PD had lived uh, for 22 years on PD, did not want to do anything else. So I, to me, that was just amazing. I'm so blessed to have known this gentleman who eventually said after 22 years, he just thought he had, he wanted to, he wanted to go to comfort care, but he did for 22 years, did PD and did well. And he was in his late eighties when he decided that he did not want to continue any further. Uh, but it was amazing to see people do it that long. I'm going to, I know I'm going to run out of time here, but I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about home hemodialysis. And home hemodialysis is where you, you basically clean the blood of toxins. So this is different from PD. You don't put any fluid in the belly. And as you can see in this cartoon, blood leaves the body through an access called a fistula or a graft. And it goes into this machine. And this is a picture of, of a next stage home hemodialysis machine. Um, so the blood goes in there. It goes into this filter. Uh, in the filter, the, the, the blood with toxins is exchanged against the dialysate. So a lot of the toxins from the blood will go into this dialysate, which is in yellow here. And then it go, that dra is drained into a waste basket or, or container. And then the clean blood and blue is returned back to the body. So basically, the whole concept here is to clean the blood, filter, and then uh, filter the blood as opposed to PD. Home hemodialysis uh, is done typically, uh, you know, four, I would say five to six times a week. The typical treatment is about three hours per session. Um, it can be done at night at home too. We have a home nocturnal, and those sessions can be as long as eight hours. Uh, you could also take a home hemodialysis machine that you have in a clinic and do it three times a week, although those machines are large and bulky it may not be as easy to operate as some of the new machines, especially the next stage machine. Um, so those are all options available to you. Uh, you would, you can do home hemodialysis without a care partner. We call it solo home hemodialysis. But to me, the, having a care partner support you in this journey is the most important thing. And to me, uh, having a care partner makes this even better. So as you can see in this picture, this is a patient whose wife really is the care partner uh, to provide the support for the patient. Training takes about four to six weeks, typically. You will need to make some modifications in some cases to your water electrical systems. If you live in an apartment, think you may need to reach out to your landlord to make sure that you have the right to modify some of the things. And you also need some supplies stored. So space for storage is gonna be important. 
So talk about access. You know, there's uh, AV fistula, as you see in the top right panel here, which the body's own material is hooked up together to create a fistula. And that allows the vein, as you can see here, to, to thicken and mature so that it can be used repeatedly for dialysis. So you would put a needle in here and that can be used to do to pull the blood from the body and to return the blood. When you use a synthetic graft, a plastic material, uh, it's called a graft. It's a little loop you can see here in the arm. So this is typically used when you don't have blood vessels that can be used to create a fistula. And in some cases, we have this thing called a catheter, which is a, a, a plastic tubing that goes from the chest into a large vein and almost close to your heart that allows you to pull the blood through this catheter to go through the hemodialysis machine. Catheters are good for temporary care, but I don't recommend long-term because of significant side effects on catheters. So catheters don't, will not prevent you from doing home hemodialysis, but although if you use a catheter, keep in mind, you have to have a strategy and a plan to get it removed and to have a, per, a permanent AV fistula or a graft created. So I want to point out that you can definitely, uh, one of the biggest things we see as a challenge is the fear of self-cannulation. Most of my patients always said, I don't think I can ever put a needle in my arm. It's not going to work. But I want you to tell you that if you want to do home hemodialysis, it's normal to be fearful of needles. But your nurse will help you and your physician will help you get rid of that fear. Some of my patients who said they would ever, never, ever use a needle to cannulate themselves not only do well, they will not let anybody else go anywhere near them to put a needle in their arm. So basically, they feel like they are the only ones who are capable of doing it. And to me, that's what we hear again and again. So needle phobia should not be a fear. We should make sure we can fix that with some education and training on self-cannulation. The advantage, again, is home therapy. So it fits into your life. You can travel. You can. It's much better tolerated. Your blood pressure drops are less. You can gain independence. It's really good for fluid and for diet. Sleep patterns are better with more frequent dialysis. Your heart and the circulation is much better if you do more frequent dialysis five to six times a week. And you can get to spend more time with your loved ones. The disadvantage, you need supplies and storage issues. It can be stressful on the family. Um, you will need to learn how to stick the needle into your fistula or use needles. And you'll have to monitor your treatments at home. And you need to be watchful of risk of infection because anytime you use needles or have a catheter in the neck, there is a risk of infection and you need to be aware of those things. I want to point out in the next couple of slides, I'm going to end in the next two or three minutes here. Um, connected health. I mean, everybody has a cell phone now. Everybody has a smartphone. And there's so much we can do with technology that allows us to sort of connect our patients to our team as well as our nephrologists. During COVID, if there's anything we've gained, and that is a digital Technology has really helped move things, right? You must have had a visit with your physician or your nurse using telehealth. It was unheard of even a couple of years ago, but now machine information can be sent to the nurse. Your own treatment information through a tablet or a phone can be sent to the nurse. The nurse can monitor treatments, look at issues before it even becomes a problem, solve, resolve it, connect with you through telehealth. So you're going to see a lot of that stuff. What I just show you are some of what Fresenius has in place that addresses it, but again, every provider has these technologies available for you to actually allow you to experience home therapy better and feel connected and confident that you can do this yourself. I also want to point out some good resources out there. This thing called My Life, My Dialysis Choice is an online tool. For folks who are in the process of making a decision about dialysis or want to consider options of dialysis or transplant, this is a great way to look at your life and your dialysis choice this tool allows you to choose what's the right treatment for you based on your preferences and your values. It helps you sort of understand what your needs are. And then this is a great tool to use before you see a nephrologist to talk about what's the best option for you. And the other resource that I always point out is the National Kidney Foundation that has so many features like the Ask the Doctor feature, other supports for peer mentoring, which allows you to talk to other patients who have similar issues who can then guide you through the process. And I want to end with a slide that basically talks about home therapy and the real benefits. Why do I feel so passionate about home therapy? It allows my patients to pursue a full life. You can enjoy life to the fullest. Dialysis should not become an impediment to enjoying your life. You can continue your passions. 
do what matters to you. Spend time with the grandkids, with your near and dear ones. Stay connected to people that matter to you. Reach and set your goals so you can achieve those goals without a problem. And last but not least, you can commit to your treatment. What it requires is you to be understanding, knowledgeable, and committed to getting your treatments done. And then save the moment in the end. So I'm going to end with a slide that sort of defines what I think is absolutely the way you should look at life. Kidney disease isn't going to define you. You define it. And just like Chris or Sam that you heard, talked, you heard about the stories I just told you, these are folks who didn't let the diagnosis of advanced kidney disease stop them from living their lives. Uh, they actually have moved on and continue to uh, enjoy life to the fullest. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's any questions, and I apologize for going over. Thank you so much, doctor. We really appreciate all the valuable information that you gave us today. We are actually a little bit short of time, so we're actually not going to take any questions. But if people have questions, you can leave them, and we will definitely try to get them answered for you by the doctor. Um, so put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. I did see a few questions going around. And I have to say that I thank you for presenting information about CCPD, especially. That's what I did. I had no issues, but, and I love, you know, as far as one can like being on dialysis, that was my preferred method of choice. And I just want to say to everyone, I see everyone sharing information and that's wonderful. I love sharing stories, sharing information, but please remember that what works for one person may not work for anyone else. Um, I live alone. I did PD. It was great for me. I'm small. I'm strong. So I'm younger. So those are factors. Um, so what works for one person may not work for another person, but definitely try to find out the right therapy for you or for the person that you're caring for, um, because that's super important. But I... I hope that you take all the information that you learned today and ask questions, ask your doctor, find out if some therapy that you found out about today that maybe you hadn't heard about before might work for you. And yeah. So th thanks again, doctor. And well, thank you for the opportunity. Gonna... I really enjoyed it. Uh, we appreciate you coming. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.